welcome. This is the Urban Farm Project's Organic Urban Farming 101 series and starting seed indoors and the greenhouse. So I have with me here Lisa Chrisman, UCA professor in mathematics and home gardener and volunteer at Urban Farm Project. And we are here today to teach you about planting seeds indoors under the grow lights and then also in the greenhouse. If you were with us a couple weeks ago, you uh, learned about the materials that were needed for today. And we have all these materials here again with us today. Uh, you could go back and watch that video anytime backslash live on our Urban Farm Project Facebook page. And I also want to introduce Erica Lundy here with us. She'll be monitoring our Facebook live stream. There's her hand. You probably saw her face last week. And uh, we also have our AmeriCorps member, Stacy Spalding, here with us today. And uh, you'll see her. She's going to grab a few things uh, for us as we carry on through this course. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, we have our giveaway. And you, we posted something earlier today. And Lisa can show you this here. So to enter into this drawing, and we'll, we'll choose a name out of a hat, of everybody that shares the post, this live stream post, and then also you've got to like and or follow our page as well. So then after doing that, please post in the comments of uh, either this live stream or that post that we did earlier <laughs> with the picture of this, that you did that because pe some people sharing, um, as far as when you share something, it doesn't show up. So be sure and let us know that you've done that. Okay, let's get started. In the link in the description of this, there's a link to the PowerPoint that we will be talking about today, and that's on a Google Drive. You can either download it or even just look at it on your computer. Um, if you are live streaming in the library, uh, we will have our 6 to 7 p.m. workshop after this class, after this live stream, so just meet us on the back patio after this, and we'll have trays and soil and seeds and We'll send you home with uh, some seeds to start at your own home. Okay. All right, first, uh, we're just going to talk about a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. So we've got materials prep, and that we did a whole course on two weeks ago. Uh, there is that video. Go back through that after this if you want to uh, just double check and make sure you got all your materials. And then we're going to talk about cleaning the trays, getting your trays and seed starters ready putting soil in the trays, planting seeds, watering, uh, placement under the grow lights and in the greenhouse, and care and maintenance. So with this being a 101 introductory course, we're not going to go real deep into things. It's just primarily let's get uh, you going so that you can start some seeds with as little expense as possible and as successfully as possible without overdoing it and numbing your mind out with all the possibilities of how you can grow seeds. Okay, so first, cleaning trays. Now there's a lot of ways you can do this. Uh, the, the most simple way and the reason you would do this is that you don't want to spread bacteria from disease that may be on plants or soil from the year before and continue that as uh, from year to year. So uh, the first step you would do is to wash your trays with warm water and you can use some Dawn soap uh, as well just to get that debris off of there as much debris as you can and then um, you'll let them dry out a little bit then you'll create a vinegar and water solution that you can dip your trays in and that will actually disinfect it so white vinegar is recommended for that here this is about a three dollar bottle and uh, you see half of it's gone. So they say a one to nine solution for vinegar and water. So what we did was a half gallon and uh, per this here, if you can uh, switch that down there, Erica. Okay, so you see we just used a trash can tall and about three quarters of the way full. So it being tall is nice because you've got these trays that you're going to dip in there. Now, with a half gallon 
a vinegar in there to about three quarters. That's about a one to nine. Vinegar's pretty potent, so it's gonna get the job done. Now, with this, I'm not gonna go too deep into getting debris off of here, but you're gonna hose it off, you're gonna scrub it, use a little pad to get the dirt off of it. Um, the more dirt that's on it, the vinegar is gonna attack it and not the, it's gonna spend too much time on that, not the actual germs that you've got. So, boom, you just let them in there. Now you're gonna let them in there for 20 minutes, let them soak. We're gonna put a few of these in here. Okay, let's see, let's set a timer after it, we'll save some of these out. And then, so that's a tray, push a tray down in there. And you can see that, Erica, if you could bend that down a little bit, there you go. Okay, so uh, something we found that you could also even just, if something starts floating up, you can kind of put something on there to keep it down. So set you a timer for 20 minutes and walk away, let them soak. So after 20 minutes, you'll come in here, you'll pull them out, and you'll rinse them off real well. You don't want that vinegar now in your soil, your new fresh soil, getting, you know, killing good bacteria and things. So rinse them off very well uh, under warm water. And then they say you can do 24 to 48 hours to just let them set, maybe even in the sun, the UV will kill a lot of things. So that's one technique. Um, if you weren't going to use even uh, vinegar, setting them out in the sun, you don't want to leave these trays in the sun for a long period of time. They will create cracking. So after you rinse them off, dry them off, instead of waiting 24 or 48 hours, which you probably may not have time to do, just dry it off, use a rag, make sure they're rinsed off really well. So that is sanitizing your trays, which is important. And it's something that, uh, you know, sometimes you just don't do. And then you realize after a week and your seeds are doing great, and then you've got a kill off on your plants and everything just stops growing and dying. And it's like, it could be a lot of things. And so if you would have spent that 30 minutes or whatever cleaning your tray, you could have counted that out and said, okay, it's not the trays with the bacteria issues, it's maybe bad seeds or unviable seeds or any number of things. Soil, not enough light, too much water. So as much as you can do up front, the better. All right, so that's our cleaning our trays. So let's say we have our trays ready. And here we've got some examples. Uh, this is a 72 pack right here. And that's a really good ratio for, per tray. And if you are following along with our uh, PowerPoint, we're on page four now, putting soil in the trays. And I am going to show you what we do here. Bring this around a little bit closer. But uh, so here we've got this is a little bit different soil. Yeah, that's good. Okay. This, is a, this is a different soil mix than what we showed the other week, but we're going to be giving these out here at our workshop, so I figured we'd start as well. That way we can see how they grow in this soil as everybody else does. So right here we've got 12 quarts of uh, 12 dry quarts of this seed starter mix. Now you're going to get about three to four trays out of 12 quarts, so usually about three quarts could give you tray and we'll just dump since we're doing two trays we'll dump half of it out in this tidy cats obviously you would want to sanitize that as well and now we're going to start dumping water in here and this is for us this is uh, rain water and we talked about our water last time uh, actually this one isn't but our other water that we've been linked to we should have used rain water for this one, but we, uh, this is just regular tap water. So pour in some, and you start out, you don't want to, especially if you're going to plant right now, you don't want to get too much in there. And I'll bring this up to you. You can tilt that down there. Okay, so you see, we're just going to mix this, and we're going to mix this really good. Seed starter mix is really fluffy. It's going to have a lot of air pockets. 
and mixing, 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 hands in there, getting it all in there. And, you know, that seemed like a lot of water at first, but now I can already tell it's going to need more. So keep on keeping on mixing it. Erica, how's things going on the, on the chats? I can see a lot of people on there. Yep, uh, we've got 25 so far, and a lot of them are liking and sharing. Okay, comments, Any, anybody? Um, nothing, no questions so far. Okay. All right, this is a good mix to show you something here. What we've got, let me see, let me get it in the light. I can get it. Okay, so here. it's it's muddy. And when you do this, there's a simple test of when it's good. So if you see that, you see that squeeze in there, there's water, that's a little too wet. So I'll add some soil now. Just a little bit of soil. You want a little bit of drippage, but not completely just drenched. And the more you mix it as well, because those pockets in there get those clumps as well. Amanda McKee says, fixing to try to get our seeds started. So I shared with garden partner, AKA my mom. Awesome. We're fixing to get them started as well. We started some, Lisa and I started some last week. So we'll show you that process. We started them the Monday after that Thursday class. So they're now in their about 10th, 11th day. So again, the squeeze technique, just a quick, simple squeeze it. Too wet, that's too wet. You want a little bit of drippage, not done. And I'm gonna move through this quick because this hour goes very fast with the amount that we're trying to cover here. Okay. If I can get this mix right, so I can give you a squeeze, a, a proper squeeze test. And Lisa, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you started your soil, your soil preparation, just from your home and UCA? Um, sure. So at home, um, I did pretty much what Zach is doing with the soil starter dampen it, put it in trays, um, and then plant seeds. Um, you know what else you want me to say? There's not, I mean, you know, <laughs> sometimes the... you'll, you may just start dry. The thing is, once uh, you water this, it shrinks. And so, like, if you just started dry in your tray, and then you watered it, you may only have half of your little hole there full. So it's just not proper. So this is, this is going to be a pretty good still wet it's not gonna hurt being wet but it's not as wet and these dry out relatively quick so that's our soil uh, now let's fill this tray up real quick and I'm gonna fill these two I'm gonna fill one up quick so that Lisa can get going when you fill these up just take them work them around there and then holes. I like these wheelbarrows, working these wheelbarrows, even in the greenhouse, roll a wheelbarrow in there. And I'm gonna set this down so it's easier. We've got all kinds of soils in here that we're doing trials on. We've got the Ozark roots that we talked a lot about. They're at a Greenbrier, Drew Hill and his family. He's got a couple sons and his wife and they all, they, uh, they make soil. So it's uh, probably not the sexiest of professions maybe um, and that's not their full profession but you know you don't hear a lot of soil makers you hear a lot of gardeners and farmers and things so we're proud of them for taking on that but with drew being a microbiologist or a biologist uh, his background he's a uca graduate um, he knows a lot about these soils so we're going to have him as a guest uh, presenter here in a couple months about talking about soil and composting and uh, tea compost so here we just flatten it all out it's gonna be pretty cool and i'm gonna get you going i'm gonna take that uh, plastic one out because it's full and then we'll get lisa starting to plant seeds and talking about how to plant seeds how deep and take it away lisa and i'll get these trays going 
All right, so one of the things when you're planting seeds is depending on the size of the seed is going to determine how deep you plant it in the ground. So here are some things that we're going to plant today, and we've got celiosa seeds, and these are really, really tiny, lettuce seeds, cilantro, beans, and then pumpkin seeds. So you can see they're very different sizes. And rule of thumb is plant about twice as deep as the size of the seed. Okay, so uh, the other way to tell how deep you'll plant your seeds is on most seed packets, they have information on the back about um, growing them, how deep to plant the seeds, how many days till they germinate, um, if you're direct sowing them in the garden, how far apart to plant them. So seed packets have a lot of valuable information on them. Let me take my mask off so I can speak a little easier. Um, so that's a little bit about the seeds now and how deep to plant them. I don't usually bring a ruler with me in the garden, but um, you know, just to measure, I a lot of times use my finger and I know, you know, each joint on my pinky finger is about three quarters of an inch. And a lot of seeds will be planted a half an inch to an inch um, deep in the soil. So I like to use my finger a lot. Um, the other thing that you can do is use a pen and this pen has a little ridge on it um, so i know that that's a, a quarter of an inch deep um, just a, a general rule of thumb so a lot of seeds i'll just poke in with my finger um, sometimes though especially if i'm planting really tiny seeds um, i'll go ahead and just do um, a little indent in each one of my um, seed packets here in my seed cells and so you just do Know, the depth that you want to plant the seed. Just make a little hole in each cell. Um, I'm going to start with these are celiosa seeds. Um, so this is a, a flower that gets kind of a, a coxcomb on it. And again, these are super tiny, um, but you just want to take one seed and put it in each one of those holes. Um, and I like to do them one at a time. And I just put these on tiny seeds like this. I'll put on a piece of white paper so that I can see the seeds and pick them up as I go. And sometimes I forget which cell I left off on, and that's okay. Um, you want to make sure that you're leaving enough air um, in that so that the, the roots have room to expand. But just tap it down, you know, cover over that hole a little bit so that the seed makes contact with the soil. Um, so there's one row of those that we've planted. So those were celiosa seeds. And I have already, all right, so those be seeds. And I made labels for these earlier on. Um, and so you want to make sure that when you plant things that you put labels on them. I'm going to do in this other tray, I'm going to do, these are purple um, potted whole beans that were grown in the library here. And these are a lot deeper. These you want to plant about an inch deep. So again, I'm going to use just my pinky finger to make a hole in there um, about as deep as I want that seed to go. If I make a hole in each and then drop a bean in each one of those. And those are not going all the way down. I'm going to stick my finger back in there and make sure those beans are all the way um, down in there. Now, beans are one of those things that you can direct sow. You can plant them directly outside. Um, but again, I want to cover over. And at this point, if you have you know, created an, an indent in there, you might need a little bit more um, soil to cover over those holes. Use that. Yeah. But you want to just make sure that, that you're filling up, you know, to the top of your cell in your um, tray. Yeah, a lot of times after you get all your seeds in there, you'll go ahead and go back and probably put like half an inch or so hole back on there. Especially with something like those bigger seeds, like the, the beans. 
So, and I like to keep one, try and keep one hand clean um, for picking up those seeds and then have one hand dirty. Um, I just find that that works relatively well. And then these were the purple pole beans. So I'm gonna put a label in there. Um, so when you label things, there are different types of labels you can use. What you, we're using right here are old mini blinds that we just cut up uh, to fit in our seed cells. You can buy commercial ones like this. You can use popsicle sticks. Um, pretty much anything that you can write and put a label on. Um, but you want to make sure that you're labeling what it is that you planted uh, so that you know when you put it in the garden what it is. Uh, one of the reasons for that is different plants are going to be spaced uh, different distances apart. So it's important to know what you're planting, how far apart um, to put those when they go in the ground. Um, I believe he's washing his hands. He sure. washed away. Okay. Um, after you get your seeds planted, um, I would plant these entire trays, and you want to make sure that these are well watered. Um, so you can take a small watering can. At home, especially if I have really tiny seeds, I'll use a spray bottle um, just to moisten the soil and make sure that everything is nice and wet. Dry seeds out of the way. <laughs> and I'm just going to to water those cells um, and these are in a, a tray at the bottom that will cover it the water will drip down into it the bottom tray so that that'll keep the water in there and it'll help keep that soil moist as well because the soil will absorb the water from the bottom up um, so you want to make sure that everything is watered well and that you keep those seeds moist throughout growing. So every day uh, you should start checking your seeds, make sure they're watered every day so that they don't dry out until they germinate. Uh, once the seedling is established, it has germinated and you have some growth on it, then uh, you can let them dry out in between watering. So, so can you go grab one of our trays of seedlings? Um, so a lot of times I'll water from the top. Um, you can also, when you're using these trays, you can just pour water directly into the tray below. And again, that will water from the bottom up. So here, this is one of the trays that we planted. And we planted these, again, we labeled these. So if you can see, um, this is gray zucchini. Um, it was a fairy morris seed, and we started it on January 11th. Now, these are fairly dry. These have dried out. So at this point, we do want to, these seedlings are established. We want to go ahead and make sure that they are well watered. These haven't been watered today. You'll see they're pretty dry, but they're still living. So we talked about this as well. Let, once they are established like this, it's good to let it dry out a bit. That way the, the roots aren't so dependent on it being soiled or watered all the time. That way when they're actually growing outside and it doesn't rain for three weeks, they've kind of established a genetics or a, a habit of Whoops. not needing water all the time. And I'm spilling water around. <laughs> and the other thing that I wanted to tell people is don't be afraid to try things. Um, as you can see, these were all planted on the same day, and some of this seed has not sprouted. Um, so most seeds will, will sprout within you know, five to seven days, sometimes takes 10 days, um, but not everything is going to grow. Not everything you plant, you know, Zach and I have been doing this for a while, and everything that I plant does not uh, grow. So sometimes it's defective seed, um, if you have old seed that's, you know, not, that's beyond a year or two old, sometimes those will not sprout as well. I usually try and start with the fresh seed when I'm um, starting from seed. Yeah. They say uh, three years is a, just a standard shelf life for seed, especially open pollinated. We're talking about open pollinated seeds. We don't use hybrid, genetically modified. Um, those seeds you can't save, usually. 
um, if they're genetically modified. And so you can't save those year to year. They don't grow back true to the same uh, product that was started. So we're talking about open pollinated. If you keep them in the freezer, sometimes they'll last 10 years or longer. I mean, there's tons of stories about beans from Uncle Sam that were found in the freezer from a long time ago. Uh, one other thing on data as well, it's good to start an Excel sheet, and we'll share this with you, and this is something we definitely do. Uh, we have an Excel sheet, and we document the whole process. of. Uh, those are also on last month's uh, event video. There's a link to that document on the Google Drive. So you want to see what's germinating. You want to take as much information as you can about you planting, the day it's planted, the seed type, the soil type, and then you can start excluding things. If you start noticing um, that a certain soil isn't working, then get rid of that soil and start over, start new. Uh, as you see here, these purple basil and this gourmet lettuce, both of which was grown at our garden last year, should be a seed. It hasn't popped up yet, so we're doing germination tests on a lot of the seeds for our seed library, and um, right now, we're going to start more lettuce in one of these to see, was it the soil that was the issue here? Was it the seed? Was it the water? We were using tap water, so I mentioned that uh, we started using our rainwater. So we're going to change up a little bit and see if the seed really will germinate, and if it doesn't, it's not a viable seed, and it's not one that we're going to share with you all. All right, Lisa. So Lisa's going to, she's planting those seeds there. Uh, any questions on seeds? Let's take some questions here. We're about 30 minutes in. No, no questions, questions yet. yet. Um, yeah, you all feel free to ask questions here. We want to uh, assist with any fears you may have with gardening or uh, lights, especially if uh, materials, where to get materials, things like that. So. Kenzie Smith asks, is there a particular temperature range the seedlings will tolerate, or does it really just depend on the plant? Some greenhouses can get hot in the full sun and cold at night. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, there's a t the sweet spot is about 70 to 73, uh, up to 75 degrees. And so we'll talk about heat mats here in a bit uh, to get that germination. You can also put your tray on top of your refrigerator. So if it gets above 80, 90, you know, with germination, you may be okay with 80 degrees, but definitely not okay with 55 degrees. Um, you're just, the soil is not going to get warm enough to germinate that seed. Setting them up on the refrigerator, it's not so much about the light, maybe at the beginning, as it is that soil temperature until it pops up. Once you start getting the green leaves and everything, it needs light. It's photosynthesis. Uh, we talked about lights last time, about the color temperature. Um, we didn't go in too much into lumens, so when you're looking for your lights, uh, try to get as many lumens as possible. You're probably going to get about 1,500 lumens. That's how bright it, that's like the amount of light, not the color temperature. And so get something with as much lumens as possible. It's okay to have a lot of light, um, but you don't want too little of light, especially if you're running it for 12 to 16 hours. Uh, something, you can get a timer for your lights as well, so we'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, so keep that temperature in the greenhouse. We talked about, especially at night right now, yeah, during the daytime in your greenhouse, you're going to want some during the day when it gets hot, even in the wintertime, that greenhouse could get up to 100 degrees it, if it's sunny out and it's a nice day. And so you want to be able to get some ventilation in there, a fan. And then in the, in the winter, uh, you'll use a heat source got this one, we talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago, an oil heater. These are good because you can, you know, set your temperature. These go at like 75, just set it on 75. It may get down to like 68 or even low 60s on here if it's really cold uh, during the night, but it's enough to keep it alive over. And then when the daytime comes, then you've got, uh, you turn this off and the sun starts warming up that greenhouse doing its job. And you've got these. So if you notice, if we get down in the 20s in your greenhouse, and we do this a lot at Bell Urban Farm, we've got to get another heater source in there because this just won't do. And that's a like an 8 by 12 
uh, greenhouse, a Yoder built. We didn't talk about that, but those Yoder builds, they're awesome. They're worth the money. Uh, there's also uh, some folks here in town that are doing greenhouses and hoop houses. Hoop houses are great as well. And um, so we're getting the we can, yeah, we'll put a link into some other local folks that are doing the uh, hoop houses and very cost effective, especially if you're going to be growing for your family, a, a lot of plants and starting all those seeds, get it, get one of these hoop houses. It'll save you a lot of headache, especially having somebody professional setting them up because you've got window, you know, the ventilation is probably the biggest thing. So, okay. We've got a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Rachel asks, any type of seeds that don't do well in the freezer? In the freezer. You know, with the freezer, you want to just vacuum pack that baggie uh, when you put your seeds in there. And really, if you if you keep them in a cool, dry, dark place in your home, and you know you're going to use it next year, that's your best bet because you could run a risk of damaging your seed if you put it in the freezer and it's not packaged correctly. A plastic baggie will do the trick, but as you know, when you put things in the freezer, a lot of times you get air in there and it it freezes. So. Uh, any seed, I think general rule with seeds is they're pretty universally the same, maybe caring for them. Being, some are going to be a little hardier than others. Some last longer. But uh, if you plan to use the seed the next year, just keep it in a cool, dry place. Don't worry about the freezer. The next question, Kenzie Smith asks, what are some of the best seeds to start early in a greenhouse like this? Okay. Yeah, I think lettuces, things like this, that you will be able to, greens that you can start harvesting now all winter long, those are great because, you know, beans, corn, those things you can just plant straight in the ground. They're a hardy seed. They're a bigger seed. You put them in the ground, and they'll probably do better, even like these zucchinis, uh, squashes, things like that. You know, put those in the ground if you're worried about space. Like, get your greens. Maybe get your tomatoes in here because uh, your greens, your tomatoes, your eggplants, start those seeds now. And and another mention, it's January 21st. Not everybody's starting seeds right now. Uh, so don't feel like you have to start right now. It could be February, middle of February, all the way up to middle of March. And last freeze generally here is April 15th, mid-April. And so... Um, even two weeks, if you get a two-week jump start and you've got some little seedlings that you can plant rather than a seed, you're two weeks ahead of the game and you've already established a healthy plant and not subjecting a seed that's about to pop up into the harsh weather that may or may not live. So you've already established, okay, the seed's living. The biggest thing is with these, by starting right now, you, you're going to repot these into another pot and you might even repot them in a third pot by this starting this early. You don't want those seed roots to get root bound. We've got another question. Cindy Thomas asks, I attended a UAEX class on rain barrels last week. They suggested that we not use rainwater on food plants because of where the rain might be have traveled through. Dirty gutters, asphalt, etc. They suggested that rainwater be used for landscape instead. Comments? Um, that is true. You know, asphalt shingles issue I think generally with, uh, from what I've studied on metal roofs, uh, even asphalt shingles, and I've seen a study where somebody was worried about because they were doing rainwater capture, they had asphalt shingles, the water came in, they tested it, and this was for their actual water for their home as well, and you know, obviously they were going to filter it, but they did a test on it, and the trace elements in it were so minute that it wasn't uh, that big of an issue. So... You know, with the University of Arkansas Extension, um, obviously extremely knowledgeable, and they they don't always practice organic techniques. You know, they're a little more susceptible to maybe a uh, pesticides, herbicides, and things like that, which is their style. We like to push more towards organic. And if you know, if you've got asphalt shingles that are super old, you wouldn't want to get that rainwater directly. You might run it through a couple of filter processes, but with that rainwater, you're going to have natural minerals. You're not going to have chlorine, uh, which is the big thing is the chlorine. And so that's why I'm a little, we did the tap water 
And, um, you know, I'm starting to wonder, okay, was it this tap water that was causing some issues? So we're going to try the rainwater. Tap water, let it, in general, not everybody has rain barrels. And so we like to usher people into organic as well. And so um, not everybody's going to have rainwater. You get tap water, just let it put it in a five gallon bucket, let it sit for 24 hours, 48 hours, let it, uh, that chlorine dechlorinate and naturally, then at least you don't have the chlorine in there, but you may, you may not also have the minerals, but at least it's clean water. Susan asks uh, that, um, I have heard that some plants like tomatoes don't like to share space. Is that true for tomatoes and which others can you think of? Plants that don't like to share space, like next to each other, mm -hmm. not very companion planting. Uh, we will, we, we are going to do a specific class on companion planting. Tomatoes like basil and marigolds and uh, maybe even, I'm not sure about mints, but the tomatoes, um, uh, there's a lot of options and yeah, the companion planting we will do uh, late March. Uh, as far as uh, that course, and so it'll be a, a hour long course on companion planting. Most things are going to be okay. You, a lot of times, you want you don't want to plant the same thing in the same area as you did last year with tomatoes as well, because then, like if you have blossom end rot that will uh, in your ground that will go into the next year when they have that same issue. So you always like to do a crop rotation, but we will get deeper into companion planting. And uh, that is, there is a lot of information about that, and it definitely deserves its own course. Anything else out there? Oh, uh, not companion planter, a planting, but in a container. Oh, in a container. Okay. I think it's about with tomatoes. You know, from what I know, my knowledge, basil. You know, put basil with your tomatoes in the same. Usually, you're not going to want to put. Uh, two things, two different plant seeds in the same little hole here, or even maybe this thing. You want to keep them separated. And then also, I like to plant, especially since we do germination rates, and I like to plant one seed per hole. You could plant two, and then if one didn't pop up, then at least you have one, or you can select which one. Um, if two of them pop up, then you'll want to pull one out. Uh, a lot of people have issues with pulling or killing a plant, so uh, just planting one would help with these issues. Hopefully that answers that. If not, I'll, uh, I'll go back on that question and maybe I can add some comment on that. And I'll find some links on companion planting as well. The library has a whole book on companion planting. So the library does have a selection of gardening books mm -hmm. and that's one that I've checked out. Okay, yeah, our Faulkner County Library here and we are doing curbside pickup Another mention, we're opening up our seed library next Monday, and so you'll be able to select, and we're going to do 10 packets of seeds this time. We did five last year just to get an idea of how many we would be able to give out. So we'll have 10 different selections out of probably like 40 different varieties that you'll be able to select. So we are pumped, and we got a good team. Erica is a library employee, and so she's going to be uh, – with Stacy Spalding managing this seed library. Stay tuned Monday for that link to the online link form. We also have the community plots out here. There's a link on our page as well if you're interested in uh, getting one of these four by four plots. And I'm just gonna add, when Zach talks about the seed packets here, a lot of times when you buy seed packets at the store or like from Johnny Seed or Baker Creek Seed mm -hmm. Company, you order online, a packet will have like 50 seeds in it or sometimes 200 seeds and what we've done is we've packaged them in smaller quantities like for me at my home garden I'm not going to plant 30 tomato plants of the same variety so I may only want you know 10 so a lot of the seed packets that we're giving out here at the library um, smaller packets will have you know 10 to 20 seeds in them um, depending on the variety of plants that they are if it's a smaller seed, usually we may say that there's 20 seeds in it and then just put a big pinch and it's probably 40 seeds in it, like lettuce or something. But that helps us regulate uh, being able to not put out too much. But also, 
this is open pollinated seeds, you want to be saving these seeds and bringing them back to the library in the fall or in the winter after you save those and then adding them back. So this is to get you started. Then you'll have a bunch of seeds of your own. You can start growing those and you'll have all kinds. And to bring them back, you can just put them in a plastic bag, just label what they are, you know, variety, when they were grown, where they were grown, and then we can take these and split them up into those smaller packs. Yep, just come up here to the library, tell the front desk circulation, or if we're still closed except for curbside, just call them in, just like you would get a book and say, hey, I've got some seeds here for the Urban Pollen Project, and they'll give them to us. Pat Ramsey asks, do we need to make an appointment to get seeds? Uh, hey, Pat, uh, you don't have to make an appointment. We're opening this online order form, and we're a couple months ahead of schedule this, this year compared to last year of opening that up. So Monday, that goes live, and it'll be... One per per, you know, you'll get 10 packs per person. Um, and that includes, like, if you have a family and you got four people in your family, each person in your family can get 10 packs. So we do allow that. So you don't have to make a reservation. And then when we open up uh, the library again, uh, we have this mobile cart, and that will be at the front of the library. And you'll get your, your seeds, and then you'll take those over to the front desk and uh, they'll fill out that we'll also have an online form essentially that they'll fill out for you put your information in there and then you can take those seeds on the back and then you'll bring what you need to grow them back to the library cindy want, uh, thomas wants to know that if people from another county like pulaski county mm -hmm. are of, uh, eligible for this um, or is it just for faulkner county residents anybody anybody can come pulaski county uh, conway county Anywhere around here, the biggest thing is you do need to come and pick them up from the library. So is it economical for you to do that? I mean, if you're looking around on Baker Creek or Johnny's or wherever, these seed onlines are closing down. Seeds are big. Even last year, and I was at Heifer Urban Farm yesterday, and they had issues with getting seeds last year. So it's... It's an eye opener. I think people uh, have always been able to get seeds. You'll go to Walmart. I'd say get in there quick. I mean, uh, I was at Walmart today and they had a lot of seeds. Surprisingly, Lowe's and Home Depot and all these places have a lot of seeds. So get them while you can, but uh, try to get those organic, open pollinated ones and anybody can come and around. And we will be making some announcements about our seed library, but I'll give you a little sneak peek of uh, that we will be uh, creating an Arkansas seed bank and so our mission with that will be to kind of have a vault here in Arkansas with us being in between 7a and 7b pretty much here on the river line uh, grow zones we have a pretty diverse area and so with us being able to collect those seeds and then being centrally located uh, getting seeds out all across the state, but then also fostering other counties and other libraries to be able to start their own seed libraries will be our mission. So be staying tuned for the Arkansas Seed Bank, and obviously that will cover all of Arkansas. Chris Covington asks, for the lazy gardeners, of the seeds that we have, what would you recommend for an easy plant and forget for this time of year and region? Plant and forget for this time of year. This arugula, I mean, bok choy, Radishes. Radishes, yeah, radishes, um, root crops, it's hard to do well. Get you, pick you up one of these. These are pretty cool, Old Farmer's Almanac. And I was going to tell you all about this. You know, I mentioned it's January. You know, not everybody's starting seeds right now. But they suggest just as a as an idea here, and we'll, we'll do radishes. So, yeah, that's an early one. Um, also, you can look on the Arkansas Extension Office website, mm -hmm. and they have a list, and it'll tell you every month what you can grow. Um, so that's a good place to look. That is perfect, and we have that link in this description here. And, I mean, the Arkansas Extension and the University of Arkansas Extension, I mean, the wealth of knowledge, tons of knowledge that you've got to go check back. That should be step number one, especially here in Faulkner County. And Chris Quinn, the horticultural extension agent, Great, she comes out here, so love those. Kevin uh, Lawson, um, more field crops type, uh, great people. Let's see, so radishes on here says, and this is by the moon, favorable, is January 29th through February 10th. 
So that's radishes. Spinach is February 11th through the 27th. And squashes, March 15th through the 28th. And then again, in April 11th through the 15th. So your squashes, you could we could be starting these things early. You know, this is just an example on, um, these are cool because it is by the moon. And that's human civilization, civilization has done that. And you think about the, the waves and the gravitational pull of the moon. It's important, you know, it pull those strong plants up out of the ground. Uh, this also, there's just all kinds of farm info on these, and they're very inexpensive. I think it's seven, eight dollars for one of these. So, Chris, hopefully that helps. Uh, let us know in your comments what seeds you do have, and if you all remember, Chris was the seed director last year and established all kinds of awesome processes that now we have inherited, and uh, loving it. Keep on rolling. Anything else on that? Um, Susan asked again uh, about the shared space. Mm -hmm. Using a non-cell container, for example, are there some plants, such as tomatoes, that don't like to share space? What is it with tomatoes? Uh, I'm going to have to look it up, but there are plants that don't like tomatoes, and it's like night. They're called night Shades. bell peppers. Nightshades? Nightshades. Um, Tomatoes, bell peppers, they're in this nightshade family, and there are, Google, I hate saying that, Google it, you know, but I just don't have the info right off the top of my head right now, and I'm going to have to bring in an expert on companion planting, honestly. Um, so that's companion planting, but also on the back of your seed packet, like these are peppers, and it says row spacing, you know, space between plants, um, two and a half anywhere from 18 inches to two and a half feet. So you can also look at how much space do they need in the garden between all of your plants. So that'll be something you can find on seed packets. Um, again, you can Google it. Um, you can look at square foot gardening books. You know, um, so what plants can you plant in just one square foot? Um, so I do that with my four by four uh, raised garden beds. Um, I'll put 16 plants in there, so each plant gets one foot of space uh, within that bed. So as far as plant spacing, again, look it up. Look on your seed packets. Google, you know, how much space does a tomato plant need? Yeah, and thank you, Stacy, for Googling this for us, because that's never a good answer to just Google it. But, uh, so tomatoes don't play nice with anything in the cabbage, the brassica family. For example, cauliflower kale, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi. Um, so yeah, the cabbage family with tomatoes, keep those away from them. That's a one example. And I'll see what else we can find if there's uh, any, especially University of Extension documents that link in there. Look around on there. I mean, they've got a really cool page on vegetable gardening and just uh, for, the, uh, for the home. I think Kenzie Smith uh, hit the nail on the head with this one. Um, I think sh what she's talking about is aleopathic plants, mm -hmm. which is where um, it's a phenomenon, phenomenon where if you plant one plant next to another, the one plant will inhibit the growth of that second plant. Um, yeah. There's uh, a bunch of plants. I'm not going to list them all. But there are some plants that will, again, not play nice, like you said, um, and will kind of steal nutrients or... Um, release a hormone that stunts the growth of another plant. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's cool. And I love when you all put information in the comments because we can all come back to that and and look at it and read it and learn from those things too. Because everybody has an ex ex expertise in a certain area. So it looks like we got about ten minutes. Uh, we talked about watering. So we've planted the seeds. Now watering. We've done that. The heat pad. And is that plugged into the power? We good on power? No, you can uh, walk that over here if you want. Yeah, we're, we, can... we got 37%. Okay, yeah, we're good. Let's uh, walk this over. And that one's not going to be too much. Okay, so we did not talk about these last week, I don't think. Or we did a little bit, but these do help. You know, it keeps that moisture, especially these first, like, three days, these plastic tops. And it kind of creates an own, its own ecosystem in there keeps that water okay so you can come on over here Erica 
So here's an idea of how we we set up our growing shelves. I've got, and I'll do this closest one here, but so now that these have germinated, we move these down, they don't need a heat pad anymore. This saves you from having to buy all kinds of heat pads. You just get your things germinated and then move on. Then you put it on your heat pad here. This one might be, the light might be a little low for this tray. You put them under there and there you go. You let it sit. It's uh, You want tw uh, about 16 hours of light on per day. So if you set a timer, if you can get a timer, electrical timer that turns on and off these lights, that's great. Or you can do it yourself, turn them off in the morning and then put them back on at lunch and give yourself an eight hour little break there. If you, even if you did 24 hours, they're still gonna grow. It's just light all the time. Um, but it's nice to give it a more natural lighting pattern. That's really it, you put them under there. You keep the lights here you can see, if you come on in here and get up close to these zucchinis, yeah, you can see here how close that light is to those. If, you know, one of them shot up, that's that's a pretty good distance. You can even come down closer to them. The LEDs, you can get a lot closer with the bulb. So we've got eight minutes left. Here, take, take a look at these tomatoes here. This This is a purple Cherokee that we grew out. We started with six of these from the Roost Seed Collection. They, uh, Dr. Locklear out of Russellville uh, sent us these six seeds. We started with 10 seeds, and now this is just, we've probably got a thousand seeds, purple Cherokee seeds, and we're doing some test trials with those as well, and they're sprouting up, they're doing well. And those were prolific on tomatoes, great juicy purple Cherokee tomatoes. Okay. Like we're about eight minutes until six o'clock. Now we're planting our seeds under the green lights. Keep those lights close to the plant as possible. Uh, and then use additional lighting in the greenhouse if it's really cloudy out or if it is winter time and you're only we're only getting a really good 10 hour solid of light and it's cloudy, you're really not getting a sufficient amount of light. Now the sun is putting off a lot more power than any of these lights will ever even accomplish. So it is getting light, but uh, that extra light in there will give a, uh, a that extra boost that it needs. Now that's in the greenhouse. Okay, so we're going to talk about care and maintenance. And there's really not a ton that you have to do with these. I mean, the, you yeah, the biggest thing is you're going to see some little insects and things, even in your house, gnats, things that will come around. And uh, diatomaceous earth is a, is a good organic technique for getting rid of ants. And last year I had a bad problem because some of our trays were pretty dirty when I started. It was just like, you know, get them in there as quick as possible. And I introduced ants into one of these, and there were a couple thousand of ants running around. And honestly, I was like, whatever, you know, they won't hurt anything. Um, the library didn't like it that much. We got rid of them. Uh, uh, but um, now we're, we're able to get those. Just try to, with the maintenance, try to get everything as clean as possible before you start. That's probably the biggest thing. And uh, anything else on your end that you do at your house? One yeah. last question from the um, from Susan. I believe I know what she's in. Um, she, oop, um, I'll summarize her question. Um, when you put seeds in those containers, we're only um, we've shown only doing one. Are there some seeds that do better or worse with you, when you put multiple seeds in there? Um, I believe. She's saying that tomatoes don't grow very well when you put like three or four tomato seeds in a single. Right. So, so most plants, you only want one plant per cell. But I know when I start seeds at home, you know, if I'm not worried about, you know, really monitoring the germination rate, I just want to make sure that I get a plant in each cell. Sometimes I'll plant two or three seeds in each cell. 
and then I will only let one seed survive. Um, I'll take the, the healthiest, you know, looking germination um, and keep that plant alive and, and then kill the other two. Um, carrots I've planted out in the garden. And again, sometimes, you know, you plant a row of seeds and carrot seeds are really tiny, so it's really hard to get like one and space them apart. And so a lot of times I'll just kind of do a row and just kind of sprinkle carrot seeds in there and you need to go through and, and thin those because they do need a certain amount of space in order for them to develop and mature. So uh, you can plant more seeds closer together to start with, but then you're going to wind up um, you know, pinching back or you know, pulling out some of those seeds. So as long as we pull them, the seedlings that have germinated out after they have germinated, it's not going to inhibit their growth anyway, any? Uh, so you're leaving one plant yes. per cell. Yes. Yes. So um, it won't. Sometimes if they're really close together, if you think mm -hmm. it's going to disturb the roots to pull one out, mm -hmm. I'll just snip the leaves off. Mm -hmm. um, I forget what the name is right now, but there's a special name for the first two leaves that appear on a seedling, um, and then those are not considered true leaves, and oftentimes they look different. Like spinach has really long, skinny the first two leaves that appear, and then the remainder of the leaves are the regular spinach-shaped leaves. So um, a lot of times, if you can, you know, just cut off the, the first two leaves that appear on the extra ones. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. If you know how to pronounce that. Uh. <laughs> Cotyledons. Cotyledons. Cotyledons, yes, that's what those are called. <laughs> it's been a hot minute since I've, I've learned these. <laughs> Learning a lot here. Uh, yeah, and usually if you just pull it out, it doesn't damage it. Lisa has a hard time doing that. She's got a lot of little carrots, which is cool because we had a, a nature homeschool group here last Thursday, which I don't think I've told you this, but they pulled some little carrots out. And, you know, you're probably going to get a smaller crop, but if you're given it enough nutrients, then you can still get those same um, plants to grow. They're just not going to be as big and you're not going to get as much fruit because they're sharing. Any other questions in there? Kind of, uh, well, uh, go ahead and toss in the comments if you plan on coming to the workshop out back. And it's a little dark right now. We're going to bring out these lights. And if it's not a giant group, then uh, we've got a big space down in here that we can get some seeds started as well inside. So we'll, we'll bring our lights out there. And so if you're going to be here, let us know. And... Any more questions that you have, even if it's later, you can put those in the comments on this video and we'll go back and try to answer those as well because these are videos that we want to be able to look at next year and then add upon and maybe do a 102 and just dive deeper into some of this as well. Uh, you can contact us, Lisa and myself. I'm Zach at fcl.org, Z-A-C-K, and Lisa... And I'm... Lisa C at uca.edu. And we're working, uh, if you are a UCA student or a professor or whoever, um, we're working on really establishing a interconnected relationship with the gardens there. We've got a lot of motivated students right now that uh, will be working at both of those, including our American Ranger Stacy. So get involved and let, shoot us an email if you want to volunteer as well. Uh, so we will have this workshop. We've got a lot of soil and some extra seed trays, and we're going to give those out for free, let you take some of that home. I want to give another big shout-out to Baker Creek. Uh, I just learned that they will be donating some more to us seeds um, through Ann, and so they've been really helpful. And then I uh, had a, a really good time at the Heifer Urban Farm Village in Little Rock yesterday and learned some of their processes and looking at their certified naturally grown process. Uh, so check them out sometime. Follow them on Facebook as well. And we do have a few minutes here, um, but if there are any, uh, any more questions on there. Um, there was one I mentioned. Baker Creek is uh, currently swamped with um, seed calls, and so there are, it's going to be difficult to get seeds from them. Yeah, somebody mentioned that on there. Uh, yeah, and you'll see that a lot with you'll see that a lot with uh, a lot of these seed companies, and so that's 
kind of shows the importance of having a local seed library as well. And it gives you a good place to take your seeds and have something to do with them. You know that they're, they're going to do it and get them used. Because a lot of times seeds just go to waste. So you can, uh, a lot of the farmers, so any farmers out there that are thinking, hey, I want to, I need a crop to grow, um, even backyard farmers, you can grow and save seed and sell seed, especially right now. Seed is in high demand. So uh, think about maybe being a seed grower, especially organic or pollinated seeds. And, and the, the, they purchase these for a relatively same as if you're going to try to sell your, your fruits and vegetables. You may get the same or more in monetary compensation for your seeds, and you may not have to do as much work because you essentially let those trees go to seed and come flip them off, let them dry out, and process that seed. And you're not spending a lot of time trying to hustle all those coupons again. Anything else on there before we close it down? Okay. We'll meet you all uh, on this back patio. We can bring a light out there, and we'll get uh, to plant some seeds. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Lisa and Erica and Stacy, for getting this going as well. And we'll see you in two weeks for our food justice course. And so we wanted to throw this out there, especially with February uh, being African American History Month, and just a, a food justice is, is big. And you think about food, how much of it, a lot of it is access. Food hunger, hunger childhood hunger, senior hunger. I mean, this is our mission at Urban Farm Project is to create growers and systems to combat this to where it's access, access, access. People that have abundance of food don't have access to get food out to people. People that don't have food have uh, don't have access to the food. So um, by growing locally and just creating community and systems where we're all connected on the food, um, that creates just such a strong, in so many ways, food is culture. Um, and then if you look back in history, and even Arkansas history, and uh, we'll talk about this more uh, in a couple weeks, and you look at food, uh, land, and agriculture, and how that land was distributed, it's, you only have to go back 100 years to see how land was distributed and how maybe land ownership back then may have been inherited for generations and has created a, a maybe a hidden system of oppression. Uh, maybe, and it's not necessarily um, purposeful now, but it can have created a system where it's like that. And, you know, land is extremely expensive. Urban land is very expensive as well. But if you can grow on a quarter acre and with techniques now, with technology, and you can create a lot of food and just feed your neighbors, then you're starting to create this more food just society. And um, it's a really great study. Uh, so we'll have a few guest speakers, including Eva, and then a few folks possibly from CMAC um, as well here in Conway. And then we'll, we'll dive into like why it's important. And, um, and food justice is important every culture, every ethnicity, every race, but you start, when you really start to study on it, uh, you'll see how uh, maybe some have uh, just through history had a little bit um, more access to the resources needed to be a farm. So that's, uh, that's what's going on in two weeks from now on Thursday. And then from there we'll uh, we haven't announced this one yet, but I'll be throwing this event up there. We'll have the seeds, um, a seed saving and workshop right before our seed swap. So stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch y'all later.